Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Hasn't this been an amazing, oh, there she is. Hasn't this been an amazing conference? Um, many thanks to all of, all of those who have made this happen. It takes a lot of work to do, and it takes a lot of work to make it look as seamless as it is. So thank you so much. I'm Francoise Hamlin, Associate Professor of Africana Studies and History here at Brown. I'm a US historian from another part of the black diaspora. I became a US historian because of my experiences during a gap year as an exchange student in Mississippi. That year pushed me to drop the law degree um, and to take up US studies, um, which led me to George Washington University as my, part of my third year towards my degree. Outside of the high school in Clarksdale, Mississippi, I'd never had a black teacher. Um, and then I walked into Adele Logan Alexander's Black Women's History class at GW. And for me, that was it. She introduced me to Black Women's History the same year Righteous Discontent came out in hardback. And in, addi in addition, we read Deborah Gray White, Darlene Clark Hine, Sharon Harley, Elsa Barkley Brown, Paula Giddings, Hazel Carby, Bell Hooks, June Jordan, Audre Lorde, all those Patricia Hills Collins, all of these pioneering black women writing about black women in a course about black women. Um, and all of these people are on so many PhD comp lists that uh, it's lovely to be able to keep reading these books. But that year, I finally understood who I was and where I needed to be. It completely rocked my world. So Professor Alexander told me to do a PhD. She told me to do a PhD in American studies. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'll do it, because you don't really say much else to Professor Alexander. I went back to the University of Essex for my final year, and then I pissed off a famous British women's studies professor when I wrote a paper in her class about racism in women's studies and in women's studies syllabi, and I used her syllabi as an example. Um, she tried to fail me, and I appealed, which is so un-British, um, and um, I just thank God for anti-racist uh, allies in the department, um, because I won that fight. Um, and I realized that I was totally in this fight, right, for good, and that academia, um, as a place of intellectual curiosity, is really policed when you uh, tread on toes, even politely. And I think everyone in this room is in the business of treading on toes. So I'm here because you all were there. And so I, I really thank the women who came before me for helping me understand. All of these women here who published in the 80s and 90s and the next generation in the 2000s, you are the reason why most of us are here now. At the time, you were surviving the academy, but your survival and your work survival seeded all of us and gave us the courage to push the walls that you had weakened, both literally and intellectually. And we're all invested in paying it forward so that the walls might come down completely. So thank you for surviving, and um, thank you for your work. Thank you for giving us all the opportunity to unite and for some of us to fangirl. I'm totally fine, darling. So I have the great pleasure of introducing the final panel in this amazing conference. In the tradition of the panels before, I will urge you to check out the detailed bios in the programs to learn more about the speakers. This panel is titled Political Organizing and Resistance Strategies. And you'll hear from Deo Gore, Associate Professor and Chair of Ethnic Studies and Critical Gender Studies at the University of California, San Diego. Ashley Farmer, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin. Brandon Terry, Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies and of Social Studies at Harvard. And our discussant is Professor Martha Jones, who now teaches at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you so much, Francoise. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. I want to apologize for being a little late. I guess it's another conference, but the labor of service. Um, I was on a really annoying phone call. <laughs> That's great. You know, the more annoying they are, the more engaged you get, because they're so annoying. <laughs> and they're like, why are you making me do this? But I was able to shut it down, because I'm in such an amazing space today. 
Um, it's a real honor to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I will let go of that energy now um, in a very California way and say, um, first, let me thank the organizers for this, Emily Owens, uh, Emily Owens, who I know from basketball, her love of basketball, not from academia, or at least first from that and now academia. Trisha Rose, who was my dissertate, one of my dissertation advisors when I was at NYU. Stephanie LaRue, who we share an advisor. Uh, Jim Campbell, he was my undergraduate advisor, worked with her. So I already feel like I have a family and the people that invited me. It's great to see folks in different contexts. I also want to thank the staff for organizing this. I know how much effort it takes to do this work and continual effort and effort that'll happen after we all go home. And so I want to thank you for uh, doing that work, particularly Christina Downs, who helped me to figure out logistics here, so on and so forth. And whoever picked a nice hotel, got us good food, <laughs> gave us breaks, all important things to help the intellectual process and make this a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'd also like to thank the amazing scholars who are here today whose research and service have helped to make possible this field of black women's history, black feminist studies, to make it possible that we have jobs, that I got hired in a position in black feminism in ethnic studies. We can talk about that later, but that's something. Um, and whose work and scholarship and thinking continue to fuel my own, to challenge me, to make me try to be better. All the panelists did it today. And um, it's just a real pleasure to be here. It is sort of the reason I became an academic, um, rooms like this, people like y'all, conversations that we're having today. And it, in this moments of when I'm doing so many other things, it reminds me of that, how important that is, how vital that is, how sustaining that is. Um, like a bunch of the other panelists here, I first encountered the amazing work by Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Righteous Discontent, as a graduate student. But I think my graduate class in uh, history at NYU was slightly different. Um, I still have my original copy of the book, which I pull out often for my own teaching, and I pulled out uh, recently to look at for this. And you can see sort of the, my intensity, my engagement with the books in the margins. I was one of those people that wrote all over the books, underlined, a double underlined, um, as evidence of how much it was speaking to what I was trying to do with my own work the marked passages, and the conversations and questions it sparked. They continue to be some of them I haven't even answered yet, right? Um, and if I'm completely honest, it was also one of those texts that I knew when I went into my graduate seminar, I was gonna like have to battle, you know, to say black women's history matters, this is important, you know, that I would get all of the same questions that I got from my own work when I was coming through from people well, I guess I can say it now, I'm like white women historians who were like, who are these people? This is not a real list, or other scholars would ask that really stupid question. This is so narrow. And I was like, as if a study on the gun in the Civil War isn't narrow, I mean. <laughs> and so partly reading that book and that intensity of my underlining and passages is about preparing myself, my own efforts to fortify myself to go in a graduate seminar where I have to take that on. But I didn't need to worry, because Professor Higginbotham had my back, right? It was a text that, in some ways, answered all those questions, right? In its very sort of rigor, it had the big questions, it had the key historical moments. It was a work that centered black women's political work and intellectual practices and took it seriously. It shed light on a dynamic historical period in the U.S. and African American history, one that's both, which I think is, as a historian, which really struck me at the moment, this moment that's seen as the nadir of black life, but yet often championed as black women's, the women's era, and I would say the black women's era. And how do you negotiate that, right? Where do black women fall into that sort of, this really vexed moment? Um, and it did so with such theoretical sophistication and astute analysis. As with all of Professor Higginbotham's work, the politics work, the study of black women in the Baptist church provides us with a complex theoretical framework for explicating the ways black women activists negotiated structures of white supremacy and heteropatriarchy through their own and often unrecognized leadership and strategic resistance, while also being attentive to the racial, class, sexual, and gender dimensions of black women's organizing. 
Indeed, in coining the term politics of respectability through the work of black women's activism, Professor Higginbotham not only highlighted how studies of black women's history allow us for new perspectives and insight into historical moments and debates, but also gives name to a complex theoretical framework for a politics that has long been a central strategy, strategy deployed by African Americans and other marginalized communities to critique white supremacy, and demand equality, access, and inclusion, but also as a weapon in intraracial contestations over leadership, representation, and political power. And I think the things have come out um, throughout the panel today, as many of the panelists have spoken today. I think in part this sort of complexity of the theoretical frameworks in righteous discontent speak to why today the term politics of respectability circulates so broadly and also gets sort of mis is mis misused and, and misread, um, and how it has a resonance well beyond history or black women's history and even the academy. I think the sustained re relevance of the righteous discontent and the broad engagement with the politics of re respectability allow for a mul multivalence practice that is meant whether you support it, try to stand against it, try to get beyond it, you have to consider how it shapes black politics. Right. It serves as a crucial uh, framework for the study of black women's activism. We can think about from the, the only two or three, maybe we need five, but two or three biographies of Ida B. Wells, and how do we think about her in terms of the politics of respectability? Barbara Ransby's work on Ella Baker, and I think about sort of uh, that great passage in, in that work where she talks about Ella Baker's investment in hats and how she dresses when she goes and meets the ordinary folks. Um, both respectable but not trying to be of a higher status than them. We can think about the black women's organizing along the civil rights movement, right? How those politics shape the moving up of, of Rosa Parks, but also constrain who people could imagine Rosa Parks would be, could be, and also limited sort of the visibility of someone like Claudette Covan. Um, and we can see it increasingly in the studies of black women's radicalism, which is what my own work uh, looks at. And in some ways, my work is, looks at sort of black women leftists and communists in the long 20th century. So I don't explicitly use the term politics or respectability, right? But I think one of the strengths of the theoretical framework is that you don't have to invoke the term to find use in this theoretical sort of construct, right? And as a concept, I think that speaks beyond both class but also political beliefs is a really powerful tool for understanding the strategies black women deploy in negotiating the complex landscape of politics, right? Um, the politi partly what I think is one of the key points in uh, Higginbotham's book that I, Professor Higginbotham's book that I love is when she writes, quote, the politics of respectability assumed a fluid and shifting position along a continuum of African American resistance. And she notes that the practices among black women Baptists, quote, emphasize reform of individual, individual behavior, both as a goal in itself and as a strategy for reform. It was self-definition and, quote, a perceived weapon of defense. It, quote, produced protest and accommodation among middle class and working class women. And I think that fluidity and pushing a framework against seeing the politics of respectability as a totalizing sort of strategy or an either or politics, it meant you were conservative or accommodating or it meant you were resistant, has uh, been really insightful for my own work looking at black women communists, right? How do I see that playing out in, in, in their sort of strategic deployment of it or engagement with it or resistance to it in some ways? Um, and I take, in particular, three key points that I just want to reiterate, because I love, um, where's Tiff I don't, Tiffany's point? I'm, a, I'm already planning the syllabus that's going to be saluting the sample. <laughs> I just feel like I want to do that for everything. And she's like, we just need it, right? There's so much of the foundational work that I think doesn't get the do it, it needs. People don't read it, don't think about it, don't engage it, or they use the terms, and I think it's a particular thing about black feminist theory that gets utilized that way. So I think we need to hashtag that. Is that right? <laughs> so to sound. Maybe. I don't, I'm not a, I'm old school in some ways, so I don't know about the tweeting and Twitter and all that, but 
I can work with it. Um, but I think in particular, I just want to highlight three points of, of Higginbotham's work, uh, in, uh, points around theorizing the politics of respectability that I find really useful in my own work. One, that we remember it emerges as a counter discourse, right, to a dominant ideology that in different historical moments and iterations has operated, right, so it has a different iteration in different historical moments, but it consistently has been used to mark African American women as inferior, pathological, and outside the bounds of normative womanhood and gender relations. It, so in some ways, employing the policies of respectability was often a strategy of protection and defense. Right? It was a useful and strategic method at specific, specific historical moments and contexts when it could provide an entry point and access to structures of power and resources. It could also work to demonstrate, right, to, to disempower the ways in which you can mobilize within and through political performances and representations. Right, that sometimes power could be gained through that strategy. But I think it also, and the, the other point that uh, Professor Higginbotham makes, is it often came with troubling political costs, right? In that it often did not, it not only excluded, but marked as unworthy many who could not or chose not to conform to these standards. It made less visible the ways of rejecting middle class values or other non conforming modes of being might operate as powerful and valuable strategies for survival and resistance and create space for other forms of political organizing. And in part, I think those things become interesting when I think about communist women who you would imagine, I think on the surface, see, uh, are always already written out of the politics of respectability, right? That their anti-capitalist positions, their investments in critiquing imperialism um, and the US state fundamentally uh, put them on the outsides of this. But I think when I look closer at my work, right, and partly when I dig a little deeper, I begin to see the ways in which their radical strategic resistance is informed by a politics of respectability at moments. And I sort of want to chart in my last few minutes um, some of the ways my current work with looks at black women's transnational activism and internationalism across the long 20th century and broadly moves from the 1890s Ida B. Wells travels to England to Audre Lorde's visit to the Soviet Union and Tashkent in the late 1970s, the ways in which looking at that work I want to sort of unpack the ways in which a politics of respectability might be at play, might inform my analysis of their strategic resistance. Um, and in part, it's interesting to think about the women I write about, because although they're radicals, leftists, or communists, they're also college-educated professionals, many of them working in, in um, middle class and white collar jobs, many of them from middle, middle class or working class backgrounds, um, and many of them very finely dressed. Like you look, at, you look at the pictures, and they are they are invested in the style of sorts, right? Um, and most were single black women who dated widely, who thought creatively and newly about uh, sort of sexual relationships, intimacy. Some were married, and even in that space, tried to think about creating different uh, sort of uh, uh, egalitarian relationships. Many of them traveled across the country, across the globe, alone. They were the sole voices that challenged the state, critiqued white supremacy, said the unpopular thing, really helped, tried to hold the US government and its imperialist practices and foreign policies uh, accountable. And in the early post-war period, when we look at the, the activism they're taking up, it sort of fits that framework. Feminist leftists like Belle Modell and Claudia Jones, people probably know Claudia Jones, Les Belle Modell, um, who are operating in the same circles, articulated a firm stance against the call for normalization that would return women, work, working women to the home. So post-war, there was a real push by the government to get women to go back to the home, particularly African-American women who had had uh, a small foothold in the workforce and unionized jobs um, during this period. At the 1948 founding conference of the Women's International Democratic Federation in Paris, France, Thelma Dell, speaking as a representative, quote, the millions of young women workers, black and white, and on behalf of the National Negro Congress, acknowledged, quote, the great responsibilities that weighed on the women of the world during the war against fascism. She went on to argue that to sustain what they call the anti-fascist movement, 
for peace and democracy required that all women, quote, struggle for labor and economic security for all, regardless of race, sex, or religion. And that women in the US, quote, break the housewife movement in our country, which would prevent women taking the places they are entitled to in industry, the professions, and public life. A few years later, Dale's uh, comrade, Claudia Jones, would issue a sterner warning against the broad post for what she called ideological and political attacks against women. And if you know anything about Claudia Jones, it's not surprising that it's a little sterner. Um, in the March 1950 article titled International Women's Day and the Struggle for Peace, Jones extends Dale's warning as she rails against a Life magazine article that in her reading, quote, brazenly offered to American women the fascist triple K, Kinder Kutch Kirch, which translated as Children Kitchen Church and was a German slogan that then got re-mobilized by uh, the Nazis uh, during World War II. And I think also you could see the ways in which it might carry some of the tenets of a res politics of respectability as well. Um, and this piece, which is carried in uh, the Political Affairs Journal, uh, Jones tried to uh, mobilize her co sort of activists and progressive forces to view such calls for, for women to return to their normal and proper roles as an effort to curtail, quote, women's social participation for peace and, quote, her pressing economic and social demands, and especially penalizing to, quote, the Negro women, the working women, and also women on the farms, in the offices, and in the professions. Black women left this forceful resistance to the post-war calls, um, for women to leave the workforce and public life and to embrace their roles as wives and mothers was a cornerstone of their efforts to hold on to access black women and working class women at Garnered in the labor force and to sustain their own leadership gains within a left organizations in the face of what Thelma Dale described as, quote, just a bit of male chauvinism hanging on. But such politics and sort of left anti-fascist positioning was not sort of immune to a politics of respectability. And in part, as the Cold War went on, anti-communism really took hold. Uh, women like Jones and other black leftists continued their global travel, continued their critiques, continued their championing of women in labor, but turned more fully to seeing the strategic use of mobilizing the tropes of motherhood and respectability and, house, and the, the work of housewives as a protective shield against political attacks and increasing government harassment, particularly in the international women's peace movement. In a 1951 article, Jones writes, so this is maybe two or three years after her first article. She writes that, quote, we have much to learn from the rich experiences of international anti-fascist women's movements in France and Italy, as well as Argentina and Africa. All countries except Africa as a continent. I can help myself. Just, um, I am a little ornery, all right. <laughs> um, as, a, as a key, quote, the, uh, and she notes a key feature of these movements is the distinct peace struggle of women linked to the defense of the needs of children, right? So the ways in which she saw the success of those movements was, was in mobilizing themselves as women defending children, right? Or as mothers and, and, uh, in, in these movements. This shift is also available, uh, is visible in the foreword to, to seen as believing a brief report on the American delegation to the Soviet Union, which was published in 1950 in the New World Review, which was a, a publication under the auspices of the National Council of American Soviet Friendship, an uh, organization that Del Modell was very active in alongside George Murphy, Jr. In celebrating the racial, regional, and employment diversity of the 19 delegates who went on this uh, trip, the report writes, notes, quote, two are ministers, one is a farmer, and all of the women are active in clubs, in civic and fraternal associations, and are proud to be called, them, uh, proud to be called housewives also. And that's an awkward and seemingly throwaway line unless you think about it in the context of their shifting politics, the ways in which they're trying to gain a foothold in debates over, black, uh, over women's sort of roles in politics while also launching these critiques against US imperialism. 
Indeed, the tropes of wife and mother were increasingly emphasized as women's peace organizations and black women activists and radicals faced anti-communist attacks and surveillance. This move in which they sought to claim a moral high ground as women, wives, and mothers did work to create some space for black left feminists to continue to organize and mobilize across a range of politics and international re arena and beyond throughout the Cold War. And in fact, one of the arguments I make in my earlier work is that we can see in the 50s black women's ability to sustain sustain a sort of left politics much longer than many of the other organizations. I think in part because people take black women for granted, but there are ways to negotiate the racial and gendered politics of the period, in part by claiming these, uh, th trying to claim this moral high ground both around race but also around gender. Um, yet these strat strategic deployments were not without cost as many of the women in the leadership were not married or mothers, thus not the ideal representative, uh, representatives of an engaged hetero heteronormative motherhood they championed. Moreover, such strategies did not protect them or their organizations from persecution. For while it was Claudia Jones' communist ide ideologies and radical activism that she championed through this call and returned to sort of women's ri rights as roles as protectors, um, and what situated her outside of the bounds of traditional respectability, embracing a politics of respectability could not protect her as a black woman and a Caribbean immigrant from the state carceral powers that led to her eventual deportation to London in 1955. Right, so in part, in, the, in thinking about that work, you can see both the limits and possibilities of it um, and the ways in which I, I think um, one of the panelists talked about earlier that the challenge to sort of a liberal notions of rights through representation has its limitations, right? And so we can see that in the figure of Claudia Jones. In closing, I sort of want to leave you with another vignette that I've been thinking about around this idea of uh, politics and respectability, but particularly how it plays out in interracial politics and sort of alliances. And this is sort of a moment in Audre Lorde's recounting of her travels to the Soviet Union, when in a plane ride to Tashkent, and if anyone if you don't know anything about Tashkent, it's one of the key sites in the Soviet Union that many black activists go to. It's considered the black part of the Soviet Union. And since the 1920s, Langston Hughes went there, Louise Thompson Patterson. If you're a black activist, you go to the Soviet Union, you stop in Tashkent, and you have a moment of solidarity, or not. <laughs> um, and Lord recalls that on the plane to Tashkent, quote, I sat with three other African women and we exchanged chit chat for five and a half hours about our respective children, about our ex-old men, all very hetero, et cetera. And that makes me pause for a moment to think about what's going on in that dynamic, right? Um, Lord's very, well she actually says very, very hetero, et cetera suggests participating in perhaps a strategic performance of black heterosexuality, of normative motherhood and conformity to maybe avoid an awkward five and a half hour travel. Or perhaps it speaks to the real vulnerability that comes with announcing your nonconformity um, in the moments, in these moments of black solidarity and alliance. Thank you. this on down to my size. All right, how's everybody doing? You still with us? All right, it's like the two o'clock slump, I know. All right, so um, I want to start off by thinking, um, talking about how happy I am to be here and to thank Emily and Trisha and the entire staff of the center for bringing us together. And I also want to pause for a moment um, to kind of talk about how black women's history is functioning in this room. So Emily and I know each other because she was, I was actually her TA at one point, right? And then she became a co-graduate student. And then now we're both, we were both students of Evelyn Higginbotham's. And then I'm sure there's some of your students in the room. And I think this is kind of an important thing to think about, especially if you um, are an undergraduate, because there are so many books, we start to think that this has been kind of a much longer tradition than it has been in so many ways. But you can really see that happening just through you know, the connections of people in this room. So I don't know, I keep kind of going back to Evelyn Hammond's um, comment last night where they said it's everything hard has been done. But I'm like, when, when you're in a field where everybody's in the room, you know what I mean, on a Friday, then that's wonderful. But there still means there's so much great work to be done, right? Um, I'd also really like to just say thank you for bringing us together. Um, 
many of you do know, and if you haven't entered into the academy yet, you will quickly find out, um, you are often laboring in your kind of own silo, yes? Um, you're fighting the good fight at the faculty meeting. Um, you are fighting the good fight to get your um, classes on the books, to teach them the way you want to teach them. And sometimes it can feel like you're very much alone in that process. Um, and these moments where we all come together really remind us that we're not, and that, um, as Professor Gore said, that the women before us have armed us with the ability to fight for that even if they're not physically in the room with us. Um, and I'm really happy to be here to celebrate um, the groundbreaking and always relevant work of my mentor, Evelyn Higginbotham. I know she has shaped so many lives in this room and is responsible for so much of the scholarship that emanates from this room. And I know I'm a better historian and teacher for having her in my life. All right, so now on from the sappy to the scholarship. Um, we're here to celebrate righteous discontent and scholars of black women's organizing such as myself are indebted to Professor Higginbotham, among the others in their generation, for giving us theories and frameworks with which to express and explore the scope of black women's organizing. As we all know, Righteous Discontent is fundamentally a book about the strength and importance of black women's organizing using the politics of respectability. And as soon as the book came out, Professor Higginbotham's contemporaries recognized it as something special. A text that shone light on the incredible intellect and activism of black Baptist church women and offered us a roadmap for understanding not just these actors, but black women across the political and organizing spectrum. However, as we move forward, as many have noted today, both chronologically and historiographically, scholars have had a more complicated relationship with the book, and in particular, the politics of respectability. As the field has grown in both size and importance, some have begun to underemphasize its importance in a framework for black women's activism. More specifically, in a field such as mine, black women's radical politics, there's an effort to really sometimes distance oneself um, from the politics of respectability and claim that the women that we study and the women that Evelyn was studying are not the same. Um, however, this position really stems from a lack of thorough understanding of the politics respectability, but not just that, and a lack of understanding of how she applied it to black Baptist church women. Um, indeed, the brilliance and resiliency of the concept is that it offers a framework and a common language with which to understand a wide range of black women's organizing. Right? Because at the core of righteous discontent is a question of how a collection of largely, but not exclusively working class women, spent their days being dehumanized and disrespected, and how they asserted their dignity and rights. Higginbotham's response to this question was that they affirmed their worth and their rights by adopting the politics of respectability. And as we all know today, her concept has become kind of a shorthand for middle class or white behavior in order to protect oneself from racism or gain access to the privileges of whiteness. However, the politics of respectability, um, as she originally conceived it, is far more expansive. Um, and even then, she anticipated the critiques of it being elite and snobbish. So this is why it always cracks me up when people think they're coming with something when they say, right? I'm like, have you met Evelyn? She you know what she's talking about. Uh, you know, like, you, she, she already said, <laughs> like, you don't think that she thought that or understood the conservative impulses of it, that it is not there in the text that there are conservative impulses of it. Um, and I think one of the things that is most important for our study of black women's um, activism is that she noted that it's, quote, um, it constituted a deliberate and highly self-conscious concession to hegemonic values. And this is the part that I think gets me the most. As she noted, these women, quote, defer to segregation in practice, yet adherents of respectability never deferred to it in principle. Let me say that again to you. They defer to segregation in practice. Adherents of respectability never defer to it in principle. Yes. So it's this impulse of being a conscious strategy and a belief system that has undergirded scholarship on black women's organizing for decades. And scholars of black women's activism are united by the goal of thinking about all the different ways in which black women asserted their dignity and their rights. So in our remaining time together, I want to um, return, give you kind of part what it's like to be Evelyn's student, part historiography, um, to talk about the multifaceted explanation of how the politics of respectability um, speaks to black women's activism and how it's generative across a wide range um, of studies. So um, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of being in one of um, Professor Higginbotham's um, graduate seminars, you know, she comes out of her office, which is like, at the time was behind another set of closed doors. 
doors, which should delineate her importance, right? And she comes into the graduate seminar room, yes? and you begin to talk about, you've got to give your presentation for the day, you've got to do everything that you need to do before we can get into the discussion. But should you happen to misquote something, Yes? Or should you happen to not be clear about exactly what that text said, she will stop you mid-tracks, yes, and be like, that is not what that said. I've even seen her get up, return behind the double doors, yes, to retrieve said text that you might be talking about, bring it to you, open it, you know, and explain to you what that text said, yes? Um, and so I am going to take us back to Evelyn's um, style of teaching and say if we return to the text, we can talk about how Professor Higginbotham argued that the politics of respectability was a way to understand why black Baptist women that she studied adopted what she called, quote, assimilationist leanings and an insistence upon blacks conformity to dominant society and norms and manners and morals. She argued that it was a way for them to assert their value and their dignity in, quote, opposition to social structures and symbolic representations of white supremacy. And very quickly, the concept became a way for historians of black women's activism to better assess the luminaries and other lesser known black women that we now know today. Indeed, it became a better way to understand the activism in both the public and private choices of women such as Anna Julia Cooper or Mary Church Terrell. Almost instantly, the politics of respectability helped us see all the different facets and angles of middle class black women's activism, whether it was implicitly or explicitly applied in these works. I'm thinking of books of Deborah Gray White's, books such as Deborah Gray White's Too Heavy a Load, or Stephanie Evans' Black Women in the Ivory Tower, among the many others. And they told us how um, these women navigated a complex racialized and gendered terrain, and that and how they saw how adopting some of the ideals that Higginbotham had shown us that black Baptist women had adopted was a way for them to both survive, but also to thrive. Indeed, these other historians showed us how purposely and consciously, again, purposely and consciously engaging in hegemonic structures, these women became activists in their communities and actively worked to assert their individual dignity and rights and refigure their own lives and opinions of their communities. Indeed, using Higginbotham's frame, scholars were now able to show us the intellect and intent and purpose behind these women's emphasis on individual behaviors and collective reform models, and link it to the larger long-standing black activist goal of reforming or revolutionizing racialized American systems. So again, not just silly club ladies, right? But as many of us have talked about today, most of us think that this definition, um, and I'm going to not say us, I know it doesn't end there, but <laughs> most other people think that this definition and the usefulness of the politics of respectability ends there, framing it as a way to study middle class black women's activism and approaches. However, I'd like to point to the ways in which it's a far more dynamic concept. Again, in Higginbotham's style, returning to the text, she says that it assumed a fluid and shifting position along a continuum of African American resistance. And that it also functioned as, quote, a common ground on which to live as Americans with other Americans of other racial and ethnic groups. And another aspect of the text that often gets lost when we talk about the politics of respectability is this particular quote. She says that it is a way in which black women could, quote, claim the self-esteem and self-determination were independent of context of race and income. Right? So these aspects of our concept get lost in attention in the popular discourse, yet they've been vital for understanding the wide range of black women's activism and organizing. Just as quickly as scholars found the politics of respectability useful for exploring a range of black women in black spaces and white spaces, others found it to be an ideal for understanding women outside of the middle class. A bevy of texts developed, again, both implicitly and explicitly um, using or addressing the politics of respectability for explaining how working class black women lived, worked, played, and most importantly for our discussion today, engaged in individual and collective organizing and assertions of their rights in, inside and outside the confines of what was, quote, appropriate behavior for black women. So here I'm thinking about Tara Hunter's groundbreaking book, To Joy My Freedom, which foregrounded how emancipated black women workers constructed their new world in the midst of the nation making of Reconstruction era. And in the process, Hunter set the standard for thinking about how white and black women define quote unquote respectability as a concept differently, and how working class black women both attended to and defied this concept through their behaviors, dress, and bodily movement. 
Other texts, including Victoria Walcott's Remaking Respectability, African American Women in Interwar Detroit, picked up on this goal of thinking about the intersection between respectability and working class black women. Walcott, and then I would argue since Walcott, people like LaShawn Harris, pretty much everybody, right, has taken us to speakeasy settlement houses, blues clubs, to show us how the politics of respectability became a concept for working class black and poor women to lay claim via, to the address, behavior, affiliations, and rhetoric in order to engage in individual acts of defiance and dignity, and how they purposely refused it when it was no longer useful to them. In Annalise Orlick's Storming Caesar's Palace, how black mothers fought for their own war on poverty, we see how black women mothers of the 20th century played, a, played into and defied the ideas of respectability politics in order to assert their self-esteem, their self-determination, and their qualification as mothers, again, irrespective of race or income. Hunter, Walcott, and others showed us how Higginbotham's concept became a terrain in which black middle class and black working class women debated and really sometimes battled over how one's dress, speech, behavior, and how it could be a form of activism, activism that either asserted or undermined the black experience. Yet whoever these scholars studied, they showed us all that respectability was not something only middle class black women could lay claim to, while also foregrounding the ways of a both and model. And this both and model is really at the heart of all black women's organizing and really black women's survival in a lot of ways. Um, she, they showed us how washerwomen, everyday migrants, welfare rights activists, and mothers moved in and out of a respectability framework when it suited them personally, when it was advantageous to them um, professionally, and when it strategically saved their lives. And um, I think that this is important to think about because it really helped us understand how we could open up black women's history to thinking about how black women are also flawed, yes? And here also I'm thinking perhaps of the work of Callie Gross and Hannah Mary Tabbs and others who really allow us to say, if there is a respectability, there's a disrespectability, and how do people move in and out of that? Because have you all read Hannah Mary Tabbs and the dis... Wild, right? This is a black woman murderer, right? And let me tell you what, she sure was respectable in court um, after dismembering people. So, you know, it's never just a, a one or the other, it's always an either or. Um, perhaps the newest trend, however, in thinking about black women's activism and respectability is found in the pages of black women's activist intellectual histories. A field on the rise, many of the books speak to the ways in which black women use their intellectual production, and I mean that broadly conceived, right, to refashion both black and white understandings of black women and womanhood as a form of activism. Yet scholars in this field, and I include myself in this particular field, are indebted to the politics of respectability framework. In Righteous Discontent, um, Evelyn tells us that the politics of respectability is, quote, a rhetoric employed by black Baptist women at once facilitated um, the acceptance and internalization of their own representations. And that a key part of their activism was, quote, a discursive effort at self-representation of refiguring, the, refiguring themselves individually and collectively in the context of American identity. And this was all done in order to counter white supremacy. So this goal of discursive refashioning and remaking one's own identity is one of the core goals of black women's activist intellectuals, and one that pivots around the idea of the politics of respectability. New and popular books such as Brittany Cooper's Beyond Respectability take us back to, rather than just beyond, some of the very same middle class black women Higginbotham studied, and others in order to help us understand how they developed theories aimed at refashioning ideas about black womanhood and how this intersected with the politics of respectability. My own book, Remaking Black Power, is also indebted to this concept of self-fashioning. At first glance, it may appear that a study of black women intellectuals in the black power movement may not have much to do with respectability. However, the concept still undergirds the questions that I'm asking. I'm interested in how black women activists engage in the same issues of self-fashioning and self-identifying through their intellectual production. Moreover, mine and other scholarship shows that how women were expressly interested in refuting the politics of respectability as a strategy while other times engaging it. Either way, the women that Cooper, I, and others are studying are building on a core activist strategy of making black women and black womanhood within the black community in America writ large, and studying when and how black women activists found the politics to respectability to be a viable strategy. 
Indeed, if the politics of respectability is also a way of thinking, then black women activists and intellectuals have shown us how black women incorporate, deploy, and defy it as an ideology. Um, and here I think that it's really important to think about how um, Evelyn shows us how to do this kind of intellectual and ideological work, yes? Although most people wouldn't think about righteous discontent as an intellectual history, it is very much a history of these black Baptist women's ideas, right? And it is born out using the same models and threads of how we um, engage with black women intellectualism by reading their texts very carefully. Um, and one of the things that I love about Evelyn is she would always, if you ever got um, dissertation back pages back for her, you might hit, your, you know, hit her with a block quote, you know, and then you thought you were hitting her with some analysis, yes? And she would write and go back up and say, that's not what that quote means, right? Those women didn't they say what you think they said. But what she was actually saying to those of us who were writing under her was go back and think very seriously seriously and give the kind of intellectual weight and work to what these women are doing. Sometimes you're over championing what they're doing, or she said to me often, Ashley, you really want these ladies to win. <laughs> um, you know, and or sometimes you are underselling them. But either way, to do rigorous intellectual history is to engage with their ideas on their terms. And I think righteous discontent offers us a really great model for how to take the words on the page, the exact text, and make sure that we are giving it its due. Finally, I think there's a lot of promise for the way the politics of respectability will continue to inform black women's activism moving forward. So one of the things that is um, coming up nowadays, as the kids say, is there's the tagline that Dr. Ford gave us, this is not your grandma's civil rights movement. The other tagline is po respectability politics won't save you, right? Those are the two kinds of taglines that are functioning around the Black Lives Matter movement, right? But embedded in both of these phrases is the idea that somehow we've moved beyond the politics of respectability as an organizing strategy. And again, this fundamentally misunderstands Higginbotham's concept. The first forgets that she described it as one of the many strategies that black women activists can use to assert their rights. And the second conflates moralizing discourses with the self-conscious choice to adopt behaviors and a rhetoric in order to reach a certain goal. And I suspect that we'll soon see um, scholarship that kind of parses this apart a little bit better um, and rethinks respectability politics versus politics of respectability as we find it. I also think that we'll start to move towards more global conceptions of the politics of respectability as black women's history um, moves you know, into the global, the dynamic, the transnational with the kind of work that, for example, um, Dr. Gore continues to do. Um, people are really interested in, think in thinking about what constitutes respect in a different time, in a different place. And here is where um, Evelyn reminds us that we owe it to ourselves and to future scholars to keep up these rigorous critiques. Um, as I often write in my grad students' um, papers now, and it's funny now that Dr. Gill gave us, um, what is it, uh, saluting the sample. I'm now going to think of this as like saluting the sample of Evelyn Marginalia. I often write when they put respectable, I write, that doesn't mean what you think it means, right? <laughs> Which is an ode to the original, which is that is not what these women are saying. Um, indeed, it is because of the capaciousness, capaciousness of the concept that it has been such a cornerstone of black women's history, and in particular black women's activist history. And I hope that our conversations today might help us reflect, as it really has for me, like this is a text that you keep revisiting, right, um, on the importance and the continued usefulness of the politics of respectability. Most importantly, though, I hope it might reopen some of our previously foreclosed ideas about the concept, namely how it helped everyday black women organizers assert a new world for themselves and how we might use it to assert a new world for ourselves today. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank professors Rose and Owens for uh, organizing this fabulous event. Uh, and inviting me, and I want to thank Christina Downs and the rest of the staff uh, for their diligent work in getting us all here safely and putting on such a remarkable event. I apologize for missing so much. We have a sick daughter uh, at home, but it's a real honor to be here uh, and to celebrate a text that I teach at least once a year, but usually two or three times a year, um, and which is, I think, one of the most important pieces of work in American scholarship writ large. Uh, and the work of one of the greatest and most influential intellectuals of our time, my beloved colleague from the other side of those doors, I'm not on that side of the door, uh, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Um, I wanted to start uh, actually where Ashley left off 
which is that in the Black Lives Matter movement or the movement for black lives, the idea that the idea of respectability politics was effectively weaponized to defend victims of police and vigilante violence and contentious forms of public protest and dissent. The transition of this black studies keyword to the mainstream, however, has also seemingly sealed its valence as highly negative, as a lot of people have talked about. Uh, it is rarely used as a self-description, that's usually a sign. Uh, and politically, it's almost always invoked as a term of opprobrium. Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, and Patrice Cullors Brignac of Black Lives Matter proudly describe their organization as one that, quote, rejects the compromise and respectability politics of the past. For these and similar voices, objections against respectability politics are plentiful and decisive. It produces and reinforces hierarchies or forms of marginalization within already subordinate groups. Uh, like Kathy Cohen calls secondary or advanced marginalization. It functions ideologically in the pejorative critical theory sense to obscure more accurate accounts of the nature of injustice by distracting us with debates over conduct or reifying the very norms that buttress oppression. Uh, respectability politics is also said to objectionably undermine important forms of solidarity by partitioning those with common cause into arbitrary categories of deserving and undeserving. It's also said to impose illegitimate demands and forms of coercion on the most vulnerable members of society and unfairly burden or impugn their forms of life. And in self-undermining fashion, it supposedly poses a subtle and severe threat to the dignity and self-respect of its own practitioners and those they claim to uplift while also failing to change dominant attitudes. Now, a great deal of what these critics call respectability politics is indeed objectionable, and even for some of the reasons just listed. However, I think, uh, as many of you have said throughout, there remains a significant concern that, as is the case for many terms with strong negative valence, references to respectability politics are often made without much care or analytical precision, the hashtag version and Professor Gill's term. Uh, consequently, pejorative invocations of respectability politics are too often over-inclusive and mischaracterize the discourses and practices under interrogation. Now, why does this matter? Well, following this approach, we may condemn ethical and political practices that do not deserve it. Or perhaps even more importantly, we may fail to provide the kind of critique that many justifications of respectability politics actually demand for us to reasonably disavow them settling instead for underwhelming and speculative objections based on their function. These failures are of paramount importance insofar as the debate around respectability is central to understanding the ethics of the oppressed, namely those questions of how oppressed persons ought to resist or seek emancipation from injustice or try to live with dignity and virtue in the face of domination. A key source of the confusion here is a widespread misinterpretation of the classic text we're here to celebrate, righteous discontent. What I hope to add to the conversation is a reading of Evelyn Higginbotham, not as a historian uh, alone, but as a political theorist. Right? And I think she's really um, not appreciated for her contributions to political theory. Uh, Higginbotham, as I understand her, aimed for the politics of respectability to improve our ability to interpret and critique subaltern politics writ large. Interpretively, righteous discontent describes discourse and action aimed at the reform of character or comportment among individuals in oppressed groups uh, and justified not just by the anticipated impact on the dynamics of oppression, but also by independent ethical justifications like appeals to virtue and vice, the good or the demands of human flourishing under non-ideal conditions. So restated, absolutely crucial to Higginbotham's interpretive account is a fundamental pluralism regarding the politics of respectability at the level of justification. The politics of respectability, she writes, emphasized reform of individual behavior and attitudes both as a goal in itself and as a strategy for reform of the entire structural system of American race relations. This formulation subtly resists the stance uh, that's been popular since at least Gunnar Myrdal and is still all too common in scholarship and commentary on black political life. It, it rejects a stance that reduces black political strivings near totally to the fight against white supremacy. 
In addition to an intersectional critique of such frameworks, which shows the import of respectability as a site of contestation across multiple axes of oppression, Higginbotham's approach also takes seriously the possibility of striving for the good and virtue in itself. It does so in part by revealing how respectability might also ground a politically radical critique of domination from the site of virtue. By virtue, I mean following the long tradition in moral and political philosophy, those excellences of character which dispose people to think, reason, act, feel, and even desire in ways we should admire and esteem, and which are picked out by terms like courage, magnanimity, benevolence, thrift, industriousness, and so forth. Righteous discontent places black women, particularly Nanny Barrows, at the forefront of an important tradition of virtue ethics and moral and political philosophy that stretches back to Aristotle and foregrounds the black women of the National Baptist Women's Convention as moral philosophers of burden virtue. Higginbotham also means, uh, as I understand it, for the politics of respectability to serve a critical role. It's supposed to clarify normative and evaluative issues raised by such practices and their justifications. I can talk more about this in Q&A, but one of Evelyn's major innovations is to dramatically expand the realm of what counts as political and thus subject to demands for justification. So coming out of political science, a lot of political scientists will just say, well, what these church women are doing, that's not politics. That's something else. And we can talk about why that is. Um, so in this sense, I think Evelyn is, I mean, she says this in the book, she's an explicit dialogue with people like Nancy Frazier and the post-Habermasian generation of Frankfurt School critical theory. And indeed, she should be read more often as one of the most influential of these critical theorists of the public sphere, engaged in understanding the relationship of counterpublics to political structures, their role as sites for the cultivation of habits and subjectivities that might ground new forms of politics, uh, so think about the convention structure of the National Baptist Convention. And the way that counter-public discourse and social movements trouble the easy boundaries between the right and the good so common to arguments in political liberalism. Indeed, among the many virtues of righteous discontent as a text is its willingness, in contrast to many conventional texts in the discipline of history, to be refreshingly upfront and explicit about its normative and ethical standards and uh, put those critiques of its subject's views in the forefront, resisting the strategy of implicitly disclosing the commitments through narrative form alone. The subsequent discourse of respectability politics, however, in, in contrast to the politics of respectability, has largely flattened the question of character reform to the acceptance and repetition of mainstream norms. It's flattened justification to strategic goals of assimilation and advancement and it's flattened critique to functionalist objections. The suspicion that guides my remarks here is that the new respectability politics in this flatter vein either captures far fewer forms of political argument and action than we often assume, or would require us to develop far more sophisticated meta-ethical and critical theoretic intuitions of the such that uh, Higginbotham gestures toward and dispatches in righteous discontent. Indeed, I want to add my voice to the chorus suggesting that we, going forward, try to use the politics of respectability to refer to Evelyn's original problematic and respectability politics to refer to the newer, more pejorative discourse. Now, when I talk about pluralism and justification or the centrality of virtue ethics, an example may help. Booker T. Washington, widely considered an exemplar of respectability politics, occasionally justified his obsessive focus on behavioral reform, like the gospel of the toothbrush, uh, by reference to its ameliorative effect on white supremacy. He would argue that the industry, thrift, capitalist success, civic responsibility, and other virtues demonstrated by blacks will, quote, go a long way in a few years toward changing the present status of the Negro as a citizen as well as the attitude of the whites toward the blacks. But independently of this strategic utility in economics and politics, however, Washington also endorsed the cultivation of character and virtue for its own sake. He defended, for example, moral education as distinct from education meant to increase wealth or seek social status. This true higher education, he argued, was, quote, meant to give us that culture, that refinement, that taste, which will make us deal truthfully with our fellow men and will make us see what is beautiful, elevating, and inspiring in what God has created. 
These commitments to the beautiful, the highest, the inspiring, and the best are influenced by Christian theology and are not, according to Washington, reducible to or dependent upon the fight against white racism or poverty. One must struggle to cherish and cultivate these virtues even in the face of oppression. Burroughs and the Women's Convention also emphasized this point in Higginbotham's words, insisting that self-esteem and self-determination were independent of context of race and income. Unlike Washington, however, and this grounds the kind of radical critique point, Burroughs consistently foregrounds the need for rights reforms to fully realize the promise of such virtues. So I think that once we break from, or at least bracket, a narrowly strategic framework that presumes that we always already know the telos of black political striving, and we really, really take seriously the pluralism that Higginbotham reveals, we can see clearly the ethical underpinnings of the politics of respectability. We can see its location within the indeterminate relationship between a norm and the morphology of actions meant to achieve or practice it. As Higginbotham writes, black Baptist women appropriated the broader cultural heritage of biblical teachings, the philosophy of racial self-help, Victorian ideology, and the democratic principles of the Constitution, and quote, infused concepts such as equality, self-respect, professionalism, and American identity with their own intentions and interpretations. It's not just a repetition, it's repetition with difference. Accounts of the politics of respectability that reduce these invocations of the norm to repetition without taking note of their re-signifying, reiterative, and subversive qualities are thus, on Higginbotham's account, seriously confused. A similar point is made in Saba Mahmoud's book, The Politics of Piety. It is not, as Higginbotham writes, a mindless mimicry of white behavior or a front without substance or content. Each enactment opens out into a constellation of other concerns, ethical concerns, ontological concerns, metaphysical ones. These may also become politicized in Higginbotham's critical theoretic sense, and they make virtue and respectability a necessary axis of contestation. So if we do not reduce virtue talk to a flattened strategic idiom, we can see how Higginbotham draws attention to other, deeper reasons why people participate in the politics of respectability based on virtue ethics, even in conditions of severe oppression. To the extent that oppressed peoples have reason not to reject the values of particular virtues in total, a critical dimension of the resistance to oppression will likely be a refusal to acquiesce to inferiorizing ideologies which suggest that those virtues of the, are the province of the dominant group alone. Okay? This is what can ground the kind of claim that Higginbotham makes when she says, the Baptist women's emphasis on manners and morals serve to reinforce their sense of moral superiority over whites. We can understand that kind of move as a reclaiming of the terrain of virtue and also at the same time as an invitation to refound American society on these redeemed norms. From the vantage point of virtue ethics, losing grasp of these core excellences makes the lives of the oppressed less commensurate with human flourishing. Where oppression is a structural or ideological obstacle to the cultivation of virtue, that itself is another reason for the wrongness of oppression and perhaps even constitutive of oppression. One of the worst ideological features of oppression and one of the big problems with racist and sexist popular culture is the way it saturates the public with these racialized and sexualized partitions of virtue. And it mistrains our judgment such that we persistently misrecognize virtuous or vicious conduct when we encounter certain kinds of people and in certain kinds of conditions. So for example, um, what might it mean to exercise courage in an atmosphere rife with sexual harassment tends to get misread as being angry or ungrateful um, or, or uh, combative, but it actually may be an example of the right kind of courage that you need in, a, in an atmosphere rife with sexual harassment. And, and racist and sexist popular culture trains you to misread that. So in the popular discourse of respectability politics, the important critical import of the concept is usually pitched in functionalist form. So why are we against respectability politics? These people say, well, because it plays a role in reproducing class hierarchy, it has an ideological function, um, or it causes or falsely legitimizes 
uh, acts of discipline or power that are really actually illegitimate. So you think about public school dress codes that punish hairstyles or modes of, of dress um, associated with the black poor. Now, Higginbotham, I think, rightly points out where her activists run afoul of these kinds of concerns. She's not obviously not blind to them. Um, but she's also attuned to something about the insufficiency of objections pitched in that form. Often, they are simply interpretively inadequate. So again, taking an activist like Nanny Burroughs, uh, she explicitly attempts to enact solidarity with poor and working women and attack the stigmatization of their work. Uh, she tries to translate this concern with respectability into explicit rights claims, denying that uh, these should be the standards on which people get civil rights. And she eminently critiques the sexism of religious practices in the Baptist church. She fundamentally assails the ideological partitioning of virtue on race and sex grounds seemingly at every turn. And even the legitimacy objections that we often rely upon are not as expansive as we think. So in the case of state policy, you take an example like the school discipline, liberal objections to the exercise of power to enforce dress codes are, are pretty clear. It's an invasion of a certain kind of sphere of privacy. But for the politics of understanding someone like Barrows, her power comes from a different set of um, social bases. It comes from social standing, persuasion, election-based religious structures of authority, and the like. So when we try to move from a liberal critique of the illegitimacy of state power to a liberal critique of someone like Burroughs in the discourse of respectability politics, there's a kind of category mistake. We're relying too heavily upon analogies with the state and need to come up with another way of grasping the, the underpinnings of social power. So when we criticize strategic justifications of respectability politics from the standpoint of efficacy or self-respect, it seems decisive. But one cannot meet justifications based on the good in the same fashion, right? Justifications based on virtue in the same fashion. It's not enough to say that the practical consequences of these beliefs reinforce an unjust social arrangement if the beliefs are true, warranted, or valid. And we often find ourselves arguing against competing notions of dignity and self-respect. The debate that the politics of respectability concept portends is one that must, at least in the most sophisticated cases like those of Burroughs, delve deeply into the depths of ethics and morality, arguing on the grounds of virtue ethics, theology, and moral norms themselves. This means availing ourselves of the tools of imminent critique to correct practices of the politics of respectability when and where they are self-undermining. It means critiquing certain unjustified compulsions to produce respectability discourse, right? Like trying to show that this only happened to a person because they were black, not because they were poor, not because they were a woman. So that, that way we compel people to produce a certain kind of respectability discourse. We might want to critique that. We also um, might want to defend where justifiable particular practices of deviance as themselves virtuous or worthy of our respect. So kind of breaking down the idea of the barrier between respectable and disrespectable uh, content and trying to rethematize things that on first glance look uh, vicious or, or deviant, but actually are full of um, virtuous conduct. And that's the thing that Kathy Cohen tries to do with her work on deviance as resistance. And it's the thing I think Higginbotham shows us with Burroughs' unruliness uh, in church politics, as she puts it. Now, I just want to conclude by saying this stance is not epistemically or metaethically neutral. It lays down a gauntlet for the defenders of pejorative respectability politics in a particular way. Higginbotham argues explicitly that, quote, such a politics did not reduce to an accommodationist stance toward racism or a compensatory ideology in the face of powerlessness. But to get much of their criticisms off the ground, defenders of the respectability politics pejorative have the difficult meta-ethical task of trying to show uh, that Higginbotham is wrong and that the advocates of respectability are mistaken or confused about the sources, nature, and content of their own beliefs. They will need to develop, probably drawing upon thinkers associated with the hermeneutics of suspicion, so people like Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, feminist and black nationalist critics of false consciousness. They'll have to develop, uh, drawing on these sources, a way of unmasking uh, respectability politics as having epistemically deficient bases that emerge from and reproduce social domination. Disavowing the idea that virtual ethics is not always already shot through with irrationality, power, and repression 
Uh, these critics would need to persuasively show that respectability talk at bottom is really something else. It's really ressentiment, it's really psychic pathology, cruel optimism, pathological desires to imitate whiteness, or bourgeois class power. I'm skeptical that this kind of task can succeed without its being uh, self-undermining or claiming unjustified epistemic or metaphysical knowledge. But we should welcome the debate in the interest of truth and emancipation. And more importantly, we should celebrate it as yet another gift of the profound legacy of Evelyn Higginbotham's indelible impact, not just on history, but on moral philosophy, political theory, and the human sciences. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to um, what I hope will be a, an effort to sum up what I think are some of the salient points. I hope we'll get to talk about some of them. I hope others of them maybe are um, to take away and to continue the reflection um, after we leave out of here at the end of the day. Um, the first is um, uh, builds off of, I think, Ashley Farmer's um, urging that we um, approach the politics of respectability and righteous discontent um, as intellectual history, um, as a study of a way of thinking, as she puts it, or a history of ideas. Um, and I think uh, along these lines, Brandon Terry's point about the necessity um, that we vis revisit the text um, through a view of Professor Higginbotham herself as a political theorist is, is someplace I'd like us to go. Um, here, um, I'd ask us what it means um, and to embrace the, um, the power of what it might mean to more firmly reflect on this text um, as indeed part of Professor Higginbotham's um, impressive and important um, intellectual dossier um, over a career. I don't have time to rehearse it, but I know much of it is familiar to you all. Um, and I raise that because I'm someone myself who has, um, courtesy of the African American Intellectual History Society, had a chance to write a bit about my own journey um, toward a gentle donning of that moniker of the intellectual, and want to suggest to us that when we affirm as I think we have today implicitly, when we affirm uh, Professor Higginbotham as an intellectual, um, we in a sense rebaptize um, this collective, all of us um, in that term. And I think that is important work um, that I hope we will continue. Now, Brandon Terry gave me an opening um, to invoke um, women um, of our own time, um, women beyond this room, um, through his. Um, opening reference to the women uh, associated with the movement for black lives. Um, and I do want to press on us to reflect about how um, we might take this very careful, erudite, um, and uh, gently, um, gen the gentle disagreement of this day um, forward into our thinking about the politics of 2019 and, and 2020. Um, my reflection and listening is um, how we think our careful study of the politics of respectability helps us understand Ayanna Presley or Stacey Abrams or Kamala Harris or the mythical, but not so mythical, 98% of right, the black women who turn out, um, vote um, en masse and um, have the power to transform um, outcomes. Um, and it begs a question for me about how we think historical texts should function in our own politics, which is to say, um, are we originalists um, with a kind of fidelity and an assistance that we return to the founding meaning or interpretation? Or might righteous discontent be a living text, um, the meaning of which is or should be responsive and useful in our own time? And what might it mean, um, even as I can feel Evelyn's eyes figuratively burning in the side of my head, um, what would it, might it mean if we let go um, of the historian's um, insistence in this room 
about a kind of fidelity and think about it as useful for the women in our own time, the black women in our own time who are making politics. The last bit, very much um, inspired by um, Dale Gore's um, um, quite explicit um, emphasis on the politics of politics of respectability. Um, and that has been sort of floating in the room, but I want to take a moment to underscore it. Um, Infopolitics, radicalism, internationalism, assimilation, parties, the state, interracial politics, feminist politics, suffrage politics, resistance, the grassroots, the local politics of slavery's aftermath, anti-racism, intersectionality, left, right, center, all of those things have been moving through the room, I think productively, um, but I wanted to just put a uh, firm point on um, this framing that Professor Gore offers us, um, which is to um, think about this across a spectrum and in dialogue with political history um, in these ways and perhaps many more. And on that point, um, what about the politics of church? What about the politics of church? And my, this is the bane many, many years in my own work. Um, how can I persuade readers, listeners, students that the politics of the church is politics too? Doesn't Vashti McKenzie, for example, belong uh, alongside Ayanna Presley and Kamala Harris and others of the black women um, who we recognize as moving us through the 21st century. Um, and if you don't know Bishop McKenzie, I'll uh, leave you to look her up. So thanks very much.